Hello, everyone, and welcome to the roundtable discussion focusing on various aspects related to extracting resources from obsolete electronics. It's a pleasure to moderate this session with four wonderful speakers that I will briefly introduce. Waste electrical and electronic equipment is considered to be one of the fast growing waste streams worldwide. And the figures published by the Global E-Waste Monitor in July indicate that a record 53.6 million metric tons of e-scrap has been generated worldwide in 2019. That's a 21% increase in five years. And, with, and while e-scrap poses serious environmental challenges, it also presents great opportunities to recover and preserve valuable resources. We have with us senior industry uh, experts from the UAE, Africa, India, and Hong Kong who will discuss and debate key trends in the sector and examine significant developments and challenges, including the pandemic's effect on the industry and new models evolving in the sector. With three decades of international experience in the electronics industry, ALN Rao is at present the CEO of Exigo Recycling, a specialist offering solutions in B2B and B2C space in electronics refurbishing, e-scrap recycling, EV battery recycling, waste to energy, among others. Prior to this, he held various leadership positions in Natiro Recycling, Aditya Birla Retail, and Videocon Group. Mr. Rao has won many distinguished awards in India. Keith Anderson sits on the board of numerous companies. He is currently the chairman of E-Waste Association of South Africa, which he founded in 2006. Keith drafted the first industry waste management plan and submitted it to the DEA in 2010. He has just launched the Africa We Forum, with the objective of establishing a uniform e-waste standard throughout Africa. Nigel Matravers is the director of Alba Integrated Waste Solutions, Hong Kong. He is a chartered civil engineer and waste manager with over 40 years international experience. Nigel has specific expertise in the resource management sector and has been responsible for studies, design, finance, project management of numerous projects in Hong Kong and UK. In Hong Kong, he has been responsible for leading the development and delivery of the world-class integrated WE project for the government. Stuart Fleming is the founding partner of EnviroServe Group of Companies, established 16 years ago. He has been instrumental in creating a change in the Middle East Africa region on environmental and sustainable processes. In 2017, Stuart led the design and build of the world's largest integrated electronic and specialized waste processing facility in Dubai. The recycling hub was launched in 2019. Thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you. So maybe we could start off with each of you giving us a brief overview of the sector and the quantities of e-scrap being generated in your respective uh, countries or regions. Keith, this time. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, yes, in South Africa, we currently um, generate around about 365,000 uh, tons of, uh, of e-waste. Uh, those are approximate numbers because we don't have legislation that compels um, any of the recyclers or the OEMs to uh, to uh, record any of this data. So it's an assumption that we've been making. Um, based on that, we only recycling about 12% of that. So there's a huge opportunity for us to uh, to address the issue uh, and move this waste away from landfall uh, or export to to other countries. Um, with the the pending um, uh, EPR legislation, which uh, was just launched on the 5th of November, uh, it will change the, the, the whole game dramatically, uh, both from a compliance point of view, um, as well from an environmental aspect as well. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, me? Yeah, uh, thank you, Solia. Um, let me start with the uh, tonnages. The tonnages we are, India is actually generating around three and a half million tons, I would say, and uh, approximately. As far as the legislation is concerned, uh, in 2011, the e waste rules were actually, uh, e waste management and handling rules were uh, was announced. And uh, in 2016, the extended producer responsibility rules and in 2018 the amendments thereof came in so under the epr over 1500 producers in the in the country are uh, you know, have uh, are uh, the producers have actually taken license and uh, the pros are around 30 34 pros and uh, as far as recyclers are concerned around 300 plus recyclers and totally, I would say a recycling capacity less than a billion tons is available currently in the country. Yeah. 
I think you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Uh, Hong Kong obviously is a city rather than a country, uh, but per capita we've got one of the highest electronic waste in the world. Um, but the principal difficult wastes are really about to about 70,000 tonnes a year. And uh, But what the government has done is produce a fully integrated uh, producer responsibility scheme with all the legislation uh, that includes paying a levy uh, for materials that come in. Uh, the retailers uh, have to be engaged and they have to uh, offer a free service uh, for uh, consumers to take their old items away. And all the electronic waste treatment facilities have to be fully licensed. And at the same time, there's controls on imports uh, and exports of material and anything uh, is banned uh, from landfill. Um, so we're quite fortunate uh, that, that we do have this fully integrated solution for Hong Kong. And in fact, the consumer uh, has it picked up from his door, whether he's on the 75th floor of a high rise block or lives in a village house, uh, we will come to his door and collect it within three days. So. It's a pretty good system, but we're in quite a unique place. How about this region? I think uh, you can also speak about the other regions you're involved in apart from the Middle East. Yeah, thank you very much, Sweela. And sorry for being a little bit late there. I had some technical glitches here. Um, I'm using my daughter's uh, Apple Mac and I'm not an Apple person. So we managed to overcome all that. I think this thing needs a, a certain recycling company that can recycle this laptop. Uh, good evening to you, Nigel. I hope that's not you still in your office at this time of night in Hong Kong, but oh dear, oh, I've got to get home. Um, I think the, the general story all of us have said is, uh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of tons and tons of electronic waste. And are there enough, I think the question moving on is, are there enough resource treatment plants to cater for all of that? So I'm glad to see the Alba plant up in Hong Kong, up and running. Um, the systems in India are, are uh, informal, but moving into a more formal process, I would sort of summarize. Africa's got a long way to go, hasn't it, Keith, um, in, uh, in regulatory and, and legislative, but fantastic start on the 5th of November for South Africa. Um, and we just continue to, uh, to, to, to work on that pyramid of the of the informal sector trying to formalize it into a recycling, trying to formalize that recycling into processing and then getting our eggs and uh, our ducks in a row as regards the uh, refining, which is the top of the pyramid. Um, but certainly the, the, the panel here today, um, I think represents probably close on 60% as a region, Middle East, Africa, um, Asia, uh, you're talking millions of kilograms. So uh, I think that answers your question, Swali. You were just mentioning Apple. So as solution providers, to what extent would you say consumer electronics and uh, IT OEMs remain committed to end of life recycling and the use of recycled content in new products at present? From your experience? You want me to go ahead again? Should I start? The, I'll start this ball. Okay. Um, yeah, the OEMs, I think in, in history of the WE directive going back now uh, many, many years, um, have seen the, uh, the, the, their requirement, their commitment. Um, there's nothing much they can do about it, is there, when, when we end up with a regulatory or legislative process. It's just how it's done and there's multiple different uh, ways in which to skin the cat of, uh, of regulation and legislation globally. Maine, the state of Maine is different to California, which is different to Mexico, Brazil. Everybody's got uh, some form of of, uh, of different process on it. So yeah, they embrace it. They embrace it when it, uh, when it happens. And um, as long as it's a fair and equal, uh, equal um, process. And, and I think Keith, you're, you're in a much better position to, to comment on, on the OEMs and, and regulatory and legislative than I am. So I'll hand the, uh, the floor over to your, your good self, uh, yeah. sir. That, uh, <laughs> um, yes, uh, so I, I concur with, uh, with Stuart's comment that, that generally they, they're up to it when required. And I, and I say that word when re required because, for example, in, in Africa, we've had the same OEMs who operate and are bounded by 
the weed legislation for 17 years not confined in South Africa. So one has to ask that, you know, that question. The other question I think which is important is um, you need legislation. There's no question that you need proper legislation. But I think at the last time that I looked, roughly about three, three to four billion of the population of the world is governed by some form of weed legislation. Having said that, look at the recovery rates. If you take Europe, they're still exceptionally low. So if you've got legislation, you're still not meeting the target, where is the problem? So, I, I, And that's a big question. I put it to the panel and some of the recyclers who will know better than me. But my question would be, if you have legislation and some countries have got really good legislation, but if they're not enforcing that legislation, then does it serve a purpose? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as far as India is concerned, um, even though the in 2011 the legislation was passed, the OEMs uh, implementing that in full uh, was not to the extent that was decided by anybody and everybody. But when the EPR rules came in, and in 2016, and that's the time where the seriousness started coming in, and uh, most of the producers started entering into it, taking the sustainability as a main agenda. And uh, but when it since it's moved from uh, it's moved to a cost-based model now. So the seriousness has actually come in into all the OEMs. And most of the OEMs are now pretty serious in ensuring that you know, they follow the rules and regulations and also try to take it to the next level, uh, like how they've been doing in different parts of the world. Seeing that it's been effectively implemented in India, the EPR system for the e-scrap sector, for the electronic sector, I, I wouldn't say it's the announcement of the rules, the registrations are there, but the implementation, again, India is a very, very large country, right? And uh, the, the rules that's been announced by the center and the understanding by the state pollution control boards and implementing it in the state, you know, there are differences there. So people are adjusting and adapting to it. So it's going to take some time, but I think the next five years time is going to be crucial for the country in understanding these rules and regulations and putting it into practice at the ground level. Uh, sorry, I think uh, for all waste streams, uh, enforcement uh, is the case. Many countries have had legislation for years, uh, but without the investment in the um, enforcement, and which also includes people uh, in the enforcement agencies uh, to go out there into the field and, and monitor what's going on, then things don't happen. Um, and I think politicians need to recognize that. That in fact, yeah, they said, yeah, we're great, fantastic amount of legislation. I don't think particularly places like the Philippines, um, uh, where the legislation is in place, but there's, no, there's nobody out there to actually make it happen. Uh, and I think that's true of many countries, to be fair. Um, and so, the, yeah, the politicians have got to recognise that they need to invest in the agencies as well as the legislation. So what we're saying really is that um, at the end of the day, regulation and legislation can come in, but if there's no enforcement of it, then it's actually worth the paper it's written on. And secondly, Keith, I mean, the figures out of Europe where there's strict control, um, why are the figures so low is the big question of 16%, but it also asks the question, are the figures correct? Yeah, I, th I think uh, excellent uh, question, Sheeran, and I wish I had the, uh, the silver bullet answer for that. Um, I think from, from us, from where we stand, stand there's a number of, of, of reasons for that. Is First, number one, I don't think the, the, the enforcement is, is there, which is, which is required. Um, uh, and secondly, you know, is, the will of the, of the OEMs also seems to be dwindling for whatever the reason. Um, and, are the, and then the other question is, are the measurement uh, formulas or tools the right ones? Um, because there's, there's a lot of debate about, are we measuring the right things actually? Um, and some, some of, the, of the OEMs are saying, yes, but you only capture part of what we recycle. Some, some part you strip our product into three different sources and you only capture one part of that. But in fact, if you add the, the total component together, then the numbers would be higher. And I think there is potentially some argument uh, around that. But I think once again, if there's, if there's any opportunity for, for, for people to, 
subvert the system, and I choose my word carefully there, then then they will do that. And and that's and that's one of for me, I think one of the biggest deterrents for 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 entrepreneurs, investors to come in and invest, as you will know, sure, but better than all of us, uh, significant amounts of money to put up a plant that treats e-waste responsibly. That costs a lot of money, and you need the feedstock to do that. But if you don't get the buy-in from the private sector and from the government to support that initiative, then it's a huge risk. So we have to tie all those things together with carrots and sticks, whatever it might be, but it has to all be tied together. Well, you've just answered the reason why I have gray hair. <laughs> yeah. the challenges. Uh, we have a question here from John Rosso, who's asking, is there a list of OEMs which do have a program for end-of-life recycling? I, I think in my, my answer to that would be in any country where there is EPR regulations, there is a program uh, because they would be compelled by that, by that program. The question would be is how, how effective are those programs? Uh, then you know you, you've got, a, you've got a, a, a winning system. And also in some countries, EPR uh, uh, OEMs can, can run their own take back scheme, um, but they still have to become a member of a PRO or they form their own PRO. You don't find many of, the, of that particular model. Um, and then the question would also be, how many PROs do you need? Because I think, once again, if you use the European model, you'll see in some countries where there's been more than one PRO, they've closed down. Because, once again, um, you know, economies of scale come in, and every, each year, yes, the tonnage is going up that's been recycled, but the cost of recycling is coming down. So it's almost a self-perpetuating problem. Um, and you know, I'm personally, I'm not, a, I'm not a big believer in having too many PROs because... I think it creates a whole lot of other problems besides sustainability issues. So, uh, what are some of the major challenges in e scrap recycling? We've been talking, okay, yes, there are figures or there is the quantities, but why is it not being recycled? So, in the regions uh, each of you specifically operate, now, what are the challenges that you've been seeing? And uh, have you developed any specific strategy to deal with some of these challenges? Right, can I start on that one? Um, it's going to be recognised that certain items are intrinsically of a higher value and sometimes considerably easier to take apart. Uh, therefore, people often will immediately look at computers and the like. Um, but it's the difficult items, the refrigerators, the air conditioners, uh, that are the ones. And in Hong Kong, that was recognised by the government as uh, being particularly uh, taxing, uh, particularly to, to do it from an environmentally sound way. Um, in that case, it's particularly dealing with the refrigerants, uh, which in many parts of the world probably are just let go to air. And we all know they've got you know, horrific uh, global warming potential. And of course, it's very uneconomic uh, to um, take apart a refrigerator properly. Uh, so that's certainly one of our, our biggest challenges uh, is that and obviously you know, capturing those gases and cleaning up the insulating foam and things like that. Um, so again, this is where the government has to step in um, because the market wouldn't naturally want to spend money uh, dealing with refrigerators in my, in my mind. Um, other materials, as I say, uh, computers and the like, then people often are quite keen to take apart. Um, TV screens are really a challenge now, um, as they've got thinner and thinner, and uh, bigger and bigger. And so the ability the, to take out the, you know, the fluorescent tubes with the mercury in is really quite a challenge, and you need some quite sophisticated equipment to do that. It's not the kind of thing that can readily be done um, manually. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, you know, the real challenges for us has been on this difficult, bulky items with low intrinsic value. I think if I could just build on what, uh, what Nigel has been saying there too, so in, and Stuart I think can also comment on this. In, um, in Africa as a continent, we, we, we have quite a unique set of challenges, I think. So you find large swaths of the country are still very much in the, in the linear economy stage where they are just uh, 
you know, use something uh, and dispose of it. Um, you'll find other other tracks in the country that are that have moved to the recycling economy, whereby there's very very basic recycling taking place. And then in very limited but growing areas, they started to adopt the circular economy model. And each one of those three sets of scenarios provides challenges in the kind of solution that you put in place to, to address the, uh, the, the, the problem. The other problem is that we are in Africa, it's a, it's a large place that so is quite large distances to, to travel. And as we all know, the reverse logistic side of, uh, of any uh, circular economy is the biggest cross factor. So we have to be slightly more innovative in how we, how we address those, those problems. You know, sort of a typical hub and spoke model uh, has its merits, but there are some, some flaws to it as well in, in such a vast country. Yeah, um, so India is concerned, uh, the, uh, most of the recyclers, uh, 300 plus recyclers, if you were to see the chart, uh, that's been announced, uh, that's been published in the CPCB website. You will see most of them are basically for IT products, right? At an average of around 1,000, 1,200 tons capacity. The entry level barrier for recyclers is very high. There are no incentives from the government at all for it matter. So mostly it's all family businesses in the country. Um, again, uh, volumetric and non-volumetric, if you were to take 70, 80% is volumetric and shipping across the country, crisscross, logistics cost is a nightmare you know, in India. Warehousing again is another nightmare there. So the, the support that's coming in for recyclers in the country is almost nil. However, as far as the processes are concerned, there are very good dismantlers out there in the country, yes. Uh, recycling, there are a few who have actually started, who have come out with indigenous uh, concepts and uh, technologies and processes and it's pretty successful there. We have actually got into uh, consumer durable recycling in a very big way. Uh, and of adding a lot of capacities in the country, trying to take it to around 100,000 tons capacity very soon. But refrigerator recycling, as Nigel and Kate did say, as was the gases, that is an issue. But we have been successfully able to you know, uh, recycle the puff and make it into briquettes and offer it to the cement kilts. Uh, that's one good thing that we have been able to do. As so the other product categories, of course, lithium ion battery, EV batteries, we've been successful there. But <clears throat> again, the TSDF or the landfills that are there, the charges that's been charged by them again is exorbitant. And the certifications, of course, there's nothing much of a certification except R2s that's available. Very, it's very expensive and hell a lot of recyclers are, cannot afford to even get those licenses on a continuous basis. So there are a lot of problems out there for the recyclers, both uh, on, on establishing or setting up the recycling facilities and also as well as the dismantling, recycling, and refining process are concerned. Yeah, you know, I think I think we 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 as an industry, um, when you look at it, it's the fastest growing waste stream, it's the most hazardous waste stream, yet there is more of the most value in the waste stream. And um, and the the um, and, and the whole scenario of, of the fridges and the, the, the ugly side of the electronic waste. Are we putting ourselves as in the industry, are we putting ourselves in the stressful situation that we're responsible for everything and anything? You know, we, we, can, we can try and save the world, but we can't do it ourselves. You know, so this is where e-waste or we is such a wide and varied thing that I think we've, we, we, we all can do what we can. But what it needs is more integrated, um, specific um, uh, um, organizations in resource treatment. Um, I, you know, I, I've seen the plants in, in, in Hong Kong. Nigel, I've seen your facility for, for the refrigerators. I personally didn't go for refrigerators for us because you've got to put a limit to what you're going to do. Otherwise, you know, you can cover a, a 15 square kilometers of, uh, of, of a facility just doing everything and anything. So um, there are challenges and uh, everybody's got to step up, uh, you know, um, outside and inside our industry to deal with the, uh, the, the stuff. And so long as we don't just all get involved with the nice side of e-waste. Yeah, yeah, I think if I can just 
add a comment to that. Um, I think it's, it's a good point, and it comes back to the question earlier on is why, why in Europe are they not successful? I think often governments, um, because they are elected officials, get under pressure by their constituents. So they push targets down onto OEMs, and those targets might not, not necessarily be realistic or be fulfillable under current uh, conditions. So I think that's, that's part of the problem. And I think also to the conundrum is those that have invested significant amounts of money, those that have set standards, um, often are disadvantaged because you'll have the fly-by nights operating at a fraction of the cost um, and, and doing a whole lot of other things. Can't you hear this, Stuart? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear? Yeah. You can. So, so I think that's a, so that's a, that's a problem for us um, to make sure. I think to this thing has to be a progressive thing. You you have to set targets, but they mustn't be too aggressive because it becomes uh, a carrot. Uh, I'm sorry, becomes a stick as opposed to a carrot. Because if you don't get the targets, then you get beaten by everybody. Rather be realistic and overachieve and slowly bring everybody up to a standard that you say this is the minimum standard. If you want to be a recycler as part of our ERP scheme, this is the minimum standard that you must uh, abide by. Uh, but this is the standard we want you to get to, but we'll give you a year or six months, whatever the case may be, to progress to that standard. So ultimately, you uplift the entire economy to a level playing field. Stuart, are there any specific challenges to uh, the Middle East, uh, the UAE, when it comes to uh, collections or a collection of East crap? <laughs> You've got such a huge facility, so I think it's a very pertinent question. Yeah, well, on the 30th of July at midday at 52 degrees and humidity, you know the situation, Swahila. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the challenges are, 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 um, are reflective of all of us in this panel and beyond of uh, regulatory, legislative uh, support. And, and going back to the point, isn't it amazing? We're in the industry of probably the most hazardous e-waste uh, e waste stream, the largest growing e stream, yet governments and politicians aren't giving us the priority support everywhere and anywhere. Isn't that a bit weird? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I got loads. Uh, there, are, uh, there are quite a few questions here, I would say. Um, Nasser Matar would like to know, is there value in just in just setting up a dismantling facility. What kind of value is there at least maybe? That's what he means. Uh, I think you should, um, if, uh, I, I think Mohammed, you, you uh, have a look on the internet and see the, the, the um, not just the good side of e-waste, dismantling and, uh, and removing the gold, I think is the heading, but you should actually look and see of, uh, if um, you can dismantle a TV and get it to Nigel in Hong Kong and make some money, uh, you'll find it a bit difficult. Adriana so here asks, as a circular economy practitioner, we talk a lot about circular design principles as being a solution, well, as being a solution. So how realistic can de redesign be? I don't know if anyone would like to take this question here. Yeah, I, I'd like to challenge it with a, with a, with a, a statement. So I think circular economy um, is very different in first world countries as opposed to third world countries. And what do I mean by that? So I think in third world countries, because of, of the need of necessity, people are actually already and have been practicing circular economy for a long time. Um, the, the guy who, who lives in the shack will take cardboard to keep him warm or to uh, provide insulation or whatever. So uh, indirectly, it's, it's part of the, the circular economy and so forth. And I think the more affluent you become up the scale, the less you participate in circular economy. Because if you're a really affluent person, um, you can have three or four or five devices line at home. You don't worry about them kind of thing. So you're not adding to it. So I, I, I think it's, it's a challenge for us. So we have to try and find the, the happy medium uh, around it. And I think very often we lose sight that whether we like it or not, it is linked to the economics uh, and the GDP per individual to make it work. Yeah, can I just step in there as well? Because um, 
part of what we do, we also take apart very old cathode ray tubes, old fashioned TVs. And they're great <laughs> because they're easy to take apart. The circuit boards are in one nice big lump and you can recover virtually everything. Okay, you've got to deal with the tube. Um, but now, in terms of the design, of course, the design is to try and get more and more into a smaller and smaller space. Uh, so you've got a 55 inch curved screen, 4G, 4K TV. Uh, and, and now it means all the uh, circuit boards are buried around the frame of the device. Far more difficult to recover. Uh, washing machines are fantastic now. You can program them with your mobile phone, which is great until the electronics fail. And then, you know, the amount of washing machines we've taken apart, which when you look at them, look brand new. Uh, but the electronics have failed and you can't get a spare part more than five years old. Uh, and so we're scrapping a uh, thousand washing machines a day at the moment. Um, so, yes, on one hand, the designers say, yeah, we're designing it uh, to be done. But on the other hand, uh, they're designing it to be thinner, lighter, smarter, and therefore more difficult to recycle than the old plasma TVs. They were brilliant. That's a very interesting question. Your answer is uh, because we know that many of the countries have a lot of uh, informal recyclers. Can you hear me? Yeah, a lot of countries have many informal recyclers. So uh, Syed Hussein would like to know, how do we discipline the informal market, which has a strong network and presence? Oh, that's a I very, think interesting, India... <laughs> that's a very yeah, yeah. interesting question. Uh, over 90% of e-waste is Actually, the informal sector, they externalize, you know, the e-waste recycling, the health, safety, and uh, also the environment. So it's going to be pretty, pretty tough. Now, what we believe uh, is, you know, how do you inculcate the informal sector into the formal sector? Now, that's the key. There are millions of people out there, families out there who are dependent on this industry. Excellent network across the country. And the reverse logistics mechanisms that they have, fantastic. Now, we, uh, we have been requesting, and in various forums, we keep discussing the same issue, that you cannot do away with the informal sector. You have to inculcate them into the formal sector, incentivize them. Now, how do we do it? Now, we have seen the, the government has been pretty strong in Swachh Bharat mission in Digital India mission in, in Make in India, Atmanirbhar Bharat. So if the government wants, the government can actually do wonders. Right? In the same concept in the e-waste segment and the plastic waste segment, uh, the informal sector plays a very, very vital role. And uh, I believe that uh, there are discussions that are happening in, a, in, a, in an advanced level, I would say, um, how do we actually incentivize the informal sector? B, the formal sector, uh, with a few PROs, with a lot of recyclers out there, have taken steps, uh, very, very positive steps in, in formalizing these informal sector into their networks. Now, that's a very good start done in the last two, two and a half years. There are thousands of people who have actually got into the net formal network. There's a lot of training that's happening, education, METI, uh, Digital India, under Digital India Mission. There's been a lot of awareness programs that's been done. So we are able to see a shift, but it's at snail space at this moment. And there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done, but the producers and the recyclers, the dismantlers and the government, all key stakeholders uh, are putting in the efforts. I think in the next five, 10 years, there would be a large population from the informal sector who would start moving into the formal sector because of the skill sets that they possess you know, the formal sector also would not possess so much of skill sets, even the rudimentary, but trust me, I mean, they have excellent skill sets. And how do we inculcate and bring them into the mainstream is a challenge, but I think in India, we've already started that. And uh, there, there will be positive news coming and going forward is what we believe so. Can you have some comments from Steve? Uh, Sorry, can't hear you, Swalita. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So Keith, I was just wondering about uh, the Africa situation with regard to the informal market. 
Yes, yeah, so so like it's just been said, we we follow a very similar path to to India, where we have you know, anywhere between two hundred and four hundred thousand um, informal waste pickers um, providing a, a valuable service, but it comes at at, at quite a cost from a, from a health perspective, um, from from uh, damage to the environment, damage to to themselves. Um, so it's it's not an it's, it's definitely not an overnight solution. Um, we've been engaging as has as have other PROs with them to have an education and training perspective uh, from forming collaborative partnerships. Um, and we uh, early next year, from Iwasa's point of view, we la launching the Iwasa Academy, uh, whereby we'll be offering formal um, on, 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 the, on the job training, as well as theoretical training, which will also get a certificate. And this will vary from a one day course for a, for a, a waste picker on a, on a, on a waste dump uh, to uh, a one month course for an environmental manager or a municipal manager and so forth. So we, 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 like has been said, we know it's a long, a long journey, but we're gonna start the, that path and hopefully by, by slowly bringing them in and making them aware of standards, uh, we, can, uh, we can achieve something. Stuart, there's a question here uh, from Goen Nair who asks, in a market like the UAE GCC, where cash flow is important, how can refineries help in recyclers or collectors sticking with responsible uh, refineries rather than those in the informal sector? Uh, what does that mean, maybe? Yeah, I guess even I was wondering, is there an informal sector? How does it function here? Uh, Okay, um, from an informal sector point of view, yeah, it's a challenge. Um, there's education, there's health risks, there's, there's all sorts of things. But I think in general, or in summary, um, I think we all are saying we embrace them. They're doing, they're doing great. And, uh, you know, the, uh, it's where it starts. Um, the informal sector, obviously, are only interested in value. They're interested in a dollar. That's it. Um, they'll, they'll chuck out the, uh, the phone that's in the refrigerator or the, because uh, they're just interested in the copper cable, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I talk for the region from uh, the west of Africa to the uh, east of Asia. Um, it's about a dollar. So you've got to embrace it and you've got to incentivize it. And I think um, all the talk in the world, um, regulatory or re legislative or anything else, it comes down to how much cents or dollars can you support that informal sector and embrace them and have them as your mates and buddies collecting anything and everything and doing a clean up country can campaign. Right. Someone here has a very practical question. Shivani asks, is it better to start as a collector and then set up a recycling plant? Yes. <laughs> so I, I, I concur with those uh, two. They absolutely start off with a min minimum cost get to know and understand the market where the where the sources are and thereafter decide if you wish to progress up the up the value chain uh, because very often people get attracted to the wealth uh, or the alleged wealth in this thing and they start investing time money and effort only to burn their fingers and be bitterly disappointed a month or two down the line so i think it's uh, learn to walk before you run literally burn their fingers <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not only that, it's uh, understanding the product, understanding packaging, handling, you know, uh, yeah. safeguarding it, you know, uh, where do you store it, how do you store it, how long do you store it, uh, multiple things. And as a collector, once you take the first step, you understand these practical difficulties, practical problems that exist on the ground. And post that, you move to the next level. I think that would give in at least 10, 20, 30 percent of the learning to start with in this particular industry. But uh, then, since we're all doing this online and we're sitting here due to COVID, I have to ask this question. Now, how has COVID-19 affected the markets for least purchased IT equipment and thus end-of-life IT equipment? And what about household consumers? Are they buying more or less uh, certain of certain items? Can I talk about consumer? Uh, um, <laughs> Hong Kong people love to go on holiday and uh, they, they love their trips to Japan and Korea and the like. And unfortunately now, of course, they can't travel. 
and therefore they've actually the economy is still pretty good therefore they've got money and so yes they've been buying more and more things uh, particularly uh, top of the line tvs um so we're definitely seeing more activity and we're also seeing a, a big increase in washing machines so whether that's down to people wanting to do be even more hygienic i don't know uh but uh uh, generally, as far as we're concerned, we definitely are seeing more. Um, I don't know about the IT side of it, um, whether those things have yet to appear in the market. From, from a South African perspective, uh, there's, they've just released um, stats uh, last week. So the online sales over the last uh, eight months has definitely increased the highest in, in, uh, across all sectors. So, yes, people are staying at home and they've um, nine months ago, most people didn't know what Zoom was or Team uh, MS Teams. Now they all adapted. So uh, technology and the fourth industrial revolution is is actually working, which is which is a good thing. And so, so yes, there has been an, an, an increase in online sales. Um, I can't, on, and I'd love to answer the question on 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 rental equipment. The only thing that I can speak of is firsthand experience. When you walk into those uh, those businesses. They've got very strict, as, as is required by law in South Africa right now, COVID restrictions. So they, you have to disinfect your, your hands upon walking in. If you haven't got a mask, you're not allowed in, in the store. Um, the staff work on a shift basis so that they isolate the shifts so to, to minimize the effect of, of COVID being passed from one staff member to the other. So quite a lot has, has, has been done. That's in the, in the, in the formal sector. In the in informal sector, you know, we only now beginning to understand that COVID lasts on metals for three to five days and, and similar two to four days, I think it is on plastics. Um, so we don't know what's happening on the waste dumps. I think, if anything, probably very little. So, and I think that's also part of this second wave that we're going through because of we find, and certainly I can only speak on our, on our numbers, we've seen that the second wave dramatic increases are in the rural areas not so much in the cities. Yeah, in, the, in India, in fact, uh, you know, we have gone through three, four, five lockdowns already. So uh, a lot of unsold inventory stuck with uh, retailers and e-commerce companies. And once the lockdown started easing out, the first sales that happened was of those inventories. Brick and mortar just recently opened. So uh, desperate sales there for them to keep them themselves afloat. But India, most of the products and parts uh, are dependent, import dependent. So the imports were not happening. So slowly and steadily the imports have started opening up, various political issues too. So hence now, currently, um, the demand for the IT products, the mobility products is on the rise. So other product categories, there has been an uptick there. But yes, the, the markets have opened up now. The festivals have come in and uh, some uptick in sales has taken place. But mostly, I would say it's IT mobility products because of education and because of work from home concepts there. So that's what the trend is here in India. Now. I, think I don't think um, I don't think anything they could have taught you at Harvard would have prepared us for COVID nineteen or what's going to come in in twenty twenty one. The uh, the the the, um, the effects of it from warehouses being closed down globally, where where feedstock was was uh, located, to purchasing um, dynamics globally of new uh, new equipment. Um, I'm sure people were vacuuming their houses more than they ever have, so therefore they've probably bought a new vacuum cleaner in the last uh, nine months, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what I what I can say is that um, the the it certainly highlighted. Uh, this, this, this issue of the um, limited cycle of electrical or electronics. It's quite radical um, that now um, the, the, the items that we're buying have a shelf life that is getting shorter and shorter. And that's not circular economy. It's one factor of circular economy that everybody's missing out on and not getting the point that we will never get circular economy unless, um, unless we, uh, we, we, uh, we try and resolve this uh, this consumerism um, issue, and that's why is electronic waste growing and growing and growing? Well, it's because the product is getting less and less and less of a shelf life. That's one of the reasons. 
So, um, I think actually we are, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. I think we're running out of time. Actually, there were, like, as you said, we were just coming to circular economy and there was the financial aspects to discuss. And there are quite a few questions here. I'm sorry, uh, we've not been able to answer all of them. We'll try and get back to you all uh, later on this. And I'd like to thank all our panelists today for taking out time and for sharing your views and insights here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope, thank you. I hope all of you enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.